My grandmother passed away last month, but nobody found her corpse until a week ago. Hazards of living out in the mountains, I suppose. My uncle couldn't believe it. He'd been driving her groceries and supplies once a month. And according to the coroner's report, she'd died a day after he'd left. What are the chances? To hear him tell it, she was just fine when he'd driven away, too. Spry as she'd ever been, she was even getting her own water from the river and doing a bit of fishing on the side. And then poof, deceased. Griff, her golden retriever, was gone now, too. My uncle thought he probably took off after realizing Grandma wasn't waking up, maybe got hungry, and went off chasing squirrels in the woods or something. My uncle strolled about and called Griff's name for hours after he'd found Grandma, looking in all his usual hiding spots, but had no luck. My opinion? Griff probably got as far away as he could. After the funeral, my brother and I offered to come up and help our uncle clean up her things. Or at least, my brother did. And I got guilt-tripped along for the ride. Apparently, she left the cabin to the two of us in her will. Split custody, not that either of us wanted it. We'd more than had our fill of memories out there. That said, it was a nice day to tidy up a dead woman's things. The summer sun shone bright, and there wasn't so much as a cloud in the sky. Overhead, sparrows darted between the towering pine trees, flitting around the cabin's small clearing while they sang their bird song. I'm going to bring this stuff down the mountain and head in for the night, Uncle Jake said, gesturing to his pickup truck full of Grandma's furniture. You two going to take off soon? Or spend the night? He looked like the spitting image of a mountain man, standing there with his tree trunk arms and red flannel shirt. The beard was the cherry on top. We'll be heading out soon, I said. Don't worry about us. The car got us up here just fine. It'll get us back down. Uncle Jake was suspicious of any vehicle that didn't have a cargo bed. Sure thing, boys. Take it easy now. He hopped into the cab of the pickup and slammed the door with a metal clang. A moment later, the engine turned over and the mountain air was replaced with a thick smell of diesel and rust. With a rumble, the truck rolled out of the cabin's dirt driveway, bobbed down the makeshift road, and disappeared to the faint rifts of ACDC's thunderstruck. Stay the night, my brother Eric said, snickering, as if we'd spend a night in this hellhole. Eric was tall and lanky, poor of eyesight, and blindingly pale. He pulled his thick glasses from his face and wiped the lenses clean on his Marvel t-shirt. I say we finish these last couple boxes and follow him down. He peered up through the pine trees overhead, where the sun was beginning its slow descent into the evening. We're a few hours from dark yet, but I want to be far from these woods when the lights go out. He shot me a knowing wink. I walked up the creaking wooden porch and pulled the thick door open. Then stop looking at your phone every five minutes and help me get this shit done. I stepped inside, leaving the door to swing in the breeze. Help me get this shit done, he repeated in a mocking tone, following me inside. I'm just trying to get in touch with Dad. He still hasn't answered my texts. Maybe that's because we don't have any service out here. I meant since the funeral. The dude's been a total recluse since Mom died. Yeah, well, I could care less. The guy's a complete asshole anyway. I crouched down in front of a bookshelf and began pulling out dusty tomes, filling my arms with as many as I could manage. He's still our dad, Eric argued. Now that Grandma's dead, it's only a matter of time before it's just the two of us. And can we be honest? Uncle Jake's a few whiskey bottles shy from dead himself. He squatted down beside me and plucked some books from the shelf. It'd be nice not to burn every bridge in this family. Can't burn a bridge that never existed in the first place, can you? I stood up and walked to the boxes by the window, then tossed the books in carelessly, wanting to be done with this as soon as possible. The longer I spent here, the more the memories threatened to come crawling back. Do you ever think about what happened? Eric asked, coming up from behind me and gently placing his books in the box. He frowned at my disorganized mess and began restacking them neatly. No. Really? Eric didn't sound convinced. I think about it almost every day. It was horrible. I didn't say anything. Instead, I walked back to the bookshelf and grabbed another armful of books, then stomped back to the box and dumped them in. Hey, Eric said. Listen, jackass, you can at least have a little courtesy. He gestured to the books he was arranging inside, neat and tidily with their spines facing upward. One of them was called Mysteries of the Cryptids. I looked away. See the effort I'm putting in, he said. Do you really need to chuck your shit everywhere? Sorry, man. 
I just don't like this place. I shook my head, feeling a chill wash over me. I want to finish this and go. So do I. But don't you think talking could be good? Not really. No. I started toward the den. Time to put some space between me and this conversation. He grabbed my arm. Please, Matt. It was 12 years ago, but it feels like a lifetime. I don't even know if I'm remembering real events anymore, just inventing things in my head. I shrugged him off, but his expression was pleading. He needed this. You won't talk to me about it, he stammered. I have no fucking clue if what I remember even happened. (sighs) With a sigh, I thunked down in my grandmother's rocking chair. It sat in front of a red brick fireplace, now filled with only the ghosts of old, charred logs. I idly thought to myself that it'd probably never be used again, because I planned on tearing this cabin down and leaving it for the insects. It would be better that way. I only wished I could tear down the memories with it. A week at this cabin had gifted me a decade of alcoholism, chronic depression, and a side of insomnia. It took a cocktail of prescription meds just to get me to sleep these days. And when I did, it was a coin toss whether or not I'd experience sleep paralysis. And now Eric wanted to dig those memories up? I flexed my right hand, staring at the thick scars that wound their way across it. Even now, all these years later, I could still see the blood. Smell it. Taste it. My heart started racing just thinking about it. And I forced myself to look away. I focused on the hearth before me, and something caught my eye. What the hell? I muttered, leaning forward. It wasn't a log. It was something much smoother. The shape was all wrong, though. I left the chair and knelt down, sifting through the ashes and burnt timber, uncovering the curious object with mounting horror. I pulled it free, brushing away flakes of ash with my fingertips. My arm quivered. Eric? I said pushing the word from my mouth. What's up? He called. I swallowed. Is this Griff? Footsteps sounded from the other room, and he came bounding in, face brimming with excitement. You found Griff? I didn't say anything. I stared at the skull in my hand, doing my best to hold back the floodgates of memories. My eyes found Eric's, and I held the skull aloft. What the fuck? He shouted, stumbling forward. He dropped to his knees, looking at the skull in terror. No way that's Griff. No fucking way. He shook his head furiously. What would he be doing in the damn fireplace, Matt? I didn't know what to say. I knew there was no reason he should have been in the fireplace. None. No dog would willingly let itself burn to death. Maybe it's a coyote, Eric reasoned, tripping over his words. Grandma probably killed it and chucked it in here so the scent wouldn't attract other animals and... There's no coyotes out here. You know that. I dropped the skull, and it cracked against the solid wood floor. A shudder ran through me, and it's way too small to be a wolf. Eric looked on the verge of tears. Griff was probably the only happy memory we had of this horrible place. Matt, why would she do that? A thousand reasons crossed my mind, all of them beginning and ending with one night 12 years ago. I stood up from the fireplace, my feet feeling weak and my sense of balance waning. I fell back into the rocking chair, and it croaked a haunting welcome. All right, I said quietly. I think it's time to talk about what happened when we were kids. Eric sat down across from me in one of the old wicker chairs we'd helped Grandma make. Where should we start? He said quietly. He stared at me with a gravity I'd never seen in him before, his hands fidgeting with the chair's wooden armrests. Poor kid was nervous. I knew a thing or two about that. I took a deep breath and placed my face in my hands, wishing I'd never quit smoking, wishing I'd never agreed to come out here. My heart thrummed and my palms were slick with sweat. Meanwhile, my thoughts couldn't stop toying with the idea that maybe confronting these memories was a mistake. Maybe acknowledging them would somehow make them real. Matt, he said softly. Let's start with the man by the river, I said forcing myself to look him in the eyes. You remember him? Eric's expression said it all. He remembered. His eyes darted to the front door, still swinging open in the breeze from when we both walked inside. I'm going to grab the door, he said. I didn't say anything, but I didn't need to. 
We both knew it'd be easier to talk about these things with some degree of security between us and the outdoors. He stalked off, shut the door, and then returned a moment later. We were what, 11 then? I said. He nodded. Though we were twins, we looked nothing alike. Eric was thin and gangly, with giant glasses and a passion for all things pop culture. I was short, a bit overweight, and had an unhealthy addiction to every form of metal under the sun. My hearing was practically shot, but the wall of noise that music created was the only time I felt like I got any peace and quiet. It was the second day at the cabin, I think. Eric looked out the window, toward where the river flowed, just past the tree line. You and I were out having a swim. Yeah, and he was watching us on the other side. How long was he there for? I shrugged. You were the one who spotted him. I wouldn't have noticed if you hadn't pointed him out. Tough to miss, really. He had that beige ball cap and the mask. Yeah. Who wore a mask out in the woods? The kind of guy who liked to watch kids swim, I guess. It was a wolf mask. A really well-made one. Thinking back on it, it almost looked like a real wolf. Remember what he said? It was impossible to forget. His words had been the catalyst to everything. The jump-off point for the worst experience of our lives. It's nearly dark, I said. It's nearly dark, Eric repeated. The two of us were silent for a moment. The shrinking daylight and the implications of what that meant not lost on us. Maybe we should do this in the car, on the way down, he said. I shook my head. I don't think it works like that, and I think you know that now too. Standing up, I crossed the room and grabbed my leather jacket from the coat rack. I threw it over my shoulders like a poncho. Now that the sun had dipped behind the tree line, the temperature had dropped with it. You're remembering things clearly again, aren't you? I know I am. He frowned, avoiding my gaze. We both knew this wasn't a normal cabin, and deep down, I guess we both came to realize we couldn't run away from our history forever either. Eric was right. If we didn't confront this now, then we'd probably be running from it for the rest of our lives. I suppose things do feel clearer, he said. Being here feels strange, like everything's coming back as vivid as the day it happened. I knew what he meant. I could picture the man by the river almost perfectly now. Dirty jeans, a checkered shirt, and that mask. It had to have been torn right off of a real wolf, because I remember the smell. It smelled dead, decaying. Eric plugged his nose, contorting his face in revulsion. You smell that too? I asked. He nodded. What is that? That's what he smelled like, the man by the river. I'd forgotten how horrible it was, but this cabin is bringing it all back to me. I glanced around the dimly lit room, where shadows grew in the corners as the sun fell lower in the sky. He told us to come to him, after warning that it was nearly dark. He said he had a gift for us. You thought he was Uncle Jake, I remember that. Yeah, I mean, who else could it have been? Grandma had built her cabin on the land of an abandoned fire watch post far from the sleepy village below. Nobody lives up here. It was only the four of us that week. When you swam over, Eric said quietly, did he say anything to you? I don't think so. I closed my eyes and drifted back to that moment 12 years ago. In spite of it being the height of summer, the river was freezing that day and the current had made it hard to get across. The man stood on the other side, waiting patiently, though. He was holding the gift behind his back, I said. I remember thinking it was a fishing rod. Eric cracked a bittersweet smile. We'd both been badgering Uncle Jake to let us use his fishing rod. I, too, remember hoping that's what it was. Talking about that was cathartic, but torturous all at once. My mouth felt dry as a bone. When I got closer... I got this weird feeling, like something was wrong. Yeah? Yeah. It's hard to explain, but it's like, even then, I knew something wasn't right. I gave in to the memory, letting it swallow me in my search for answers. Grandma's cabin seemed to fade away, replaced by a warm summer day. The river rumbled behind me now, and the mountain breeze caught at my wet, shaggy brown hair. Above, the sun beat down furiously, dressing me in a full-body sunburn. I realized it wasn't Uncle Jake when I stepped out of the river. You never told me that before. I don't think I ever let myself believe it. In the cabin, 
The branches swayed above us, their long arms scratching at the roof in the rising wind. So, Eric said. So what? So what made you realize it wasn't him? Oh, I chewed on my lip, my eyes staring at Griff's cracked skull on the floor. It was because he twitched. Twitched? Yeah, I said, looking Eric in the eyes. My voice cracked despite my deep efforts to keep it steady. His entire body twitched, like some kind of predator reaction, like a cat seeing a mouse or a wolf seeing a rabbit. The implication hung in the air between us. We were prey. I wanted to run back into the river. I wanted to scream for help. I wanted to hide, but he held the gift out. The book, Eric said. That's right, the mysteries of the cryptids. I'd gotten halfway back across the river when Uncle Jake came down, I continued. He was on your side of the river and dressed entirely different from the man. I paused, recognizing this was one of the memories I'd never fully accepted. How could I have? Accepting it meant I was more broken than I was comfortable admitting. That's when I realized we weren't alone on the mountain. I opened my eyes and pulled myself out of the memory. It felt a little disorienting, like my senses were being thrown about in some sort of amnesiac tornado. But I did what I could to reground myself in reality. I focused on my weight in the rocking chair, the cool feeling of leather around my shoulders, and the roaring wind outside. Eventually, the cabin returned to focus. Eric ran a hand through his curly brown hair. You think that maybe? Outside, the sound of shattering glass rang out. Eric and I jumped to our feet. My heart thundered in my chest. The two of us stood frozen, each knowing we needed to act, but not knowing how. Being the older twin, I breathed deep and stepped forward, forcing my body to act in spite of its fear. I slid along the wall toward the four-pane window. It was dusk now, and the last rays of sunlight barely pierced through the thick pine trees. Darkness began to overtake the landscape, and the once lush tree line now looked more like a gaping nightmarish maw. I peered out the window at an angle, so that I wasn't squarely in front of it, in case anybody was watching from outside. Fuck! I shouted, catching a view of my car. A massive, broken branch lay flat against its now equally broken windshield. What? Eric took a furtive step forward. Is somebody there? No. I pulled my jacket from around my shoulders and shoved my arms through the sleeves, zipping it up proper. Fucking branch just smashed my windshield. Story time is over. We're getting out of here. Eric burst out laughing, his hand on his chest. Holy shit, Matt. That sound scared the crap out of me. It was just a tree branch? Yeah, I said bitterly, storming from the room and toward the front door. Just a tree branch smashing a windshield that I can't afford to fix. What a goddamn relief. I'm sorry, man. Eric shouted, jogging after me. He wasn't really sorry, but I couldn't blame him. That sound could have been about a thousand worse things than a stupid branch. Even still, it wasn't in my budget. I gripped the handle of the front door and flung it open, preparing for a chilly drive down the mountain. And then I stumbled backwards. My breath caught itself in my chest. I opened my mouth to say something, anything, but the words weren't there. Behind me, I heard Eric mumble a soft, "Uh oh, then a loud crash. Had he fainted? No, this wasn't happening. Please, don't let this be happening. A boot stepped past the doorway, creaking on the cabin's old wooden floorboards. With it came a stench of decay. I reached blindly, desperately around me, unwilling to take my eyes off of the figure, but also needing a weapon, anything. I only found empty air. Uncle Jake had already moved most of Grandma's things. With each step the intruder took, I took one back, until finally I came up against the far wall. The figure stood framed in the dark of the hallway, a ball cap on its head, and two glowing yellow eyes. It's nearly dark, it said. I shook Eric, waking him from his fainting spell. He sat up groggily, rubbing the back of his head where he'd knocked it against the hard wood. What happened? He muttered. How to say this? A lot. He blinked and his eyes scanned the room. Then he froze, his hand gripping my arm as he looked up at the man by the river, standing before us dressed in his beige ball cap, checkered shirt, and dirty jeans. The wolf mask he wore reeked of decay, and its eyes glowed a faint yellow. It's nearly dark, the man said. Yeah, I know, I said irritably. You all right, Eric? He looked from man back to me, his mind probably reeling. What's going on? He whispered. I shrugged. It was the truth. I had no idea what was going on. 
When the man had cornered me at the end of the hallway, I expected myself to be torn limb from limb, maybe have my teeth made into a nice necklace. Instead, he just said it was nearly dark and stood there expectantly. It took me a few moments before I realized he wasn't going to attack me, and that's when I awkwardly walked around him and came to check on Eric. I don't think he's going to hurt us, I said. Not that I knew for sure, but I figured if we'd survived this long, then we might be in the clear. Although I don't really know what his deal is. Eric stood, steadying himself against me. He studied the man. What if he's warning us? What if he was warning us back then, too? The book flashed in my mind. The Mysteries of the Cryptids, a pulp fiction novel the man had given me during our last encounter, back when I was just a kid. Eric had packed it into one of Grandma's moving boxes, not even realizing it. If he is, then he probably wants us to read that book. I marched from the room, past the man, and tore open the box of books. I rifled through it, tossing whatever I didn't need in every which direction. Finally, at the bottom, I found it. I picked it up and ran my fingers over its faded cover. The thing was in pretty bad shape, with some of the pages fused together from water damage during its river crossing. The illustration on the front was of a Sasquatch being strangled by a sea monster. Lovely. Is this what you want us to read? I asked the man. He didn't move, didn't speak. Let me guess, I said, crossing the room back to Eric. It's nearly dark. Don't be a dick, Eric muttered. He held out a hand for the book, and I passed it to him gladly. Out of the two of us, Eric was the academic. If there was a mystery to be solved in those pages, then he would be the one to do it. This thing looks like it was written in the 50s, he said, looking over its cover, right down to the art style. He flipped the book in his hands, scanning the text on the back and reading it aloud. A compendium of the greatest mysteries known to man. Cryptids have long since fascinated the scientific community, though their existence is highly contested. Here are three great tales sure to frighten and entertain. He furrowed his brow, his eyes rescanning the text as if he might have missed something. A moment later, he shook his head. This just looks like an old monster novel. He stared at the man. Is this a prank? I mean, if it is, it's pretty good. How'd you know we were coming back up here? The man didn't speak. Eric looked at me and sighed. I guess we can read it? Sure, I said plucking the book from his grip. We'll read it on the way down the mountain. I stuffed the book in my jacket pocket and made for the front door. The man stepped in front of me. It's nearly dark, he said. You're right, and that's our cue. Eric, let's go. Eric looked at me in disbelief. Matt, this is practically what we've been waiting for. The answers are here, I mean. He gestured incredulously at the man. Here he is, and he isn't even trying to eat us or whatever. Don't you want to figure this out? Look, I said, nobody said we needed to sort this shit out tonight. We can take the book, do a novel study back at Uncle Jake's, and then come up here with plenty of daylight hours and piece it all together. A chill ran through me, like the memory of the man. The memory of our first night was returning too, and I wasn't ready to face that again. Talking was one thing, but this therapeutic walk down memory lane had grown a bit too real for my liking. Sound good? Eric stared at me with stubborn defiance. If we had inherited anything from our late grandmother, it was our unfailing resistance to having our minds changed after they'd been made up. Luckily for me, I was more stubborn by a mile, and Eric knew that. Sure enough, he folded his arms and looked sidelong to the window. All right, fine, he said. We'll leave tonight. But I'm not kidding about this. We do as you say, study that book, and then come back. I nodded, and I meant it. I hated this. Don't get me wrong. It scared me in all the wrong ways. But I'd been through enough hours of therapy and dumped enough money into booze to know that if I didn't sort this shit out now, then I'd either end up dead or bankrupt. I promise you we'll be back tomorrow. Eric waved me off. Sure, whatever. Let's go. I let out a sigh of relief, thankful that Eric was much more reasonable than myself. All right, Wolfie, you heard us. We'll be back first thing tomorrow. I gave him an awkward half salute and moved to step past him, but he grabbed my wrist. It's nearly dark, he said. I tried to pull my arm from his grasp, but his grip was ironclad. I get that. That's sort of why we want to get the hell out of here. I could feel my wrist bruising as his calloused hand squeezed. Get off of him, Eric shouted, grabbing the man's fingers and trying to pry them free. 
I brought my other hand around and did what I could to help. But it was like trying to pull apart a vice clamp. It's nearly dark. The man growled, his voice now guttural and beast-like. It's nearly dark. His wolf teeth dripped saliva, and his eyes flared with wild rage. Something agonizing dug into my arm, and I realized claws were growing from his fingers, black and horrible, piercing into my skin so that my blood ran down them. Stop! I screamed, certain that at any moment my wrist would be ground to dust. Jesus Christ, please! The man's body twitched, and he pulled me effortlessly toward his jaws. The reek was overwhelming. I gagged, my body in sensory overload. With a violent jerk, I felt my wrist snap as he tossed me sideways. My nose collided against the wall with a dull crunch, and pain exploded across my face. I struggled onto my hands and knees. My body quaked from the agony, my vision blurring and ears ringing. Something dripped onto the floor, and I wasn't sure if it was tears or blood. Eric rushed to my side. Matt! I shrugged him off, standing on my own two feet so that I could look at the wolf-faced bastard in the eyes. If this fuck was going to kill us, I wasn't going to take it lying down. I'd make him earn it. I dashed into the den, Eric staring after me dumbfounded. There, by the fireplace, exactly what I was looking for. I gripped the fire iron, holding it before me with my good hand, and rushed back into the kitchen. Get behind me, Eric! I shouted. We're getting the hell out of here! Eric didn't move. Had he seriously given up? No, it wasn't that. It was that his attention had been stolen by something else. He stood, gazing transfixed out of the four-pane window. Between my broken wrist and smashed nose, I could hardly think past the agonizing pain rioting through me, but I still found the will to fight. Eric, he was sightseeing. Mad? He muttered. Get behind me, Eric. He turned toward me, his hand pointing hopelessly toward the forepain. Something's out there, Mad. My legs felt weak, and for a moment, I forgot about my wrist and nose. I forgot about the throbbing hurt. What's out there? Memories clawed at the edges of my mind, and I pushed them down. I needed to focus. Eric looked back to the window, and a moment later, an ear-splitting roar rang out, so loud that I couldn't tell which direction it came from. It felt like it was everywhere all at once. Get away from the window! I shouted. He took a couple unsteady steps backward. It's starting! I turned to the man, who stood as still as ever. What the fuck are you going to do to us? I screamed. I brought the fire iron down on him, but he grabbed it and tossed it aside as if it were a piece of styrofoam. It's dark, he growled. A thud sounded against the cabin's heavy door, then another. The timber of the entire structure shook, dust falling down from the rafters and whatever Uncle Jake had failed to take with him crashing to the floor. Matt, Eric said, inching toward me. It's happening again. I swallowed. Memories rushed around me, my mind smothered by them. We need to hide, I said hastily, anxiously. Eric was sweating, his face a mask of panic. Where? This is where we hid last time. Then we have to hide somewhere else for fuck's sake. I didn't know what was happening or why we were reliving this, but I knew the man wasn't going to help us. At best, he was a neutral party. At worst, he had kept us here to die. I gripped one of Grandma's wooden kitchen chairs and with as much strength as I had in my right hand, flung it clear through the four-pane window. The front door exploded, flying across the vestibule and colliding against the far wall with a deafening crash. Something screeched, then stepped inside with a thunderous footfall. I didn't need to say a damn thing. Eric had already climbed through the shattered window. He reached inside and helped me to get myself up to the sill. Then I rolled over it and landed in the dirt outside. Throwing his arm under my own, he heaved me to my feet. I immediately noticed a tire where it shouldn't have been, with a massive bite mark in it. My eyes drifted to my car in horror. Its roof had been caved in, and half of its wheels were flattened. I spared a moment to look back at the man. He was motionless, though it was hard to call him a man anymore. The mask looked to have fused with his neck, and his hands, or paws, were now covered in fur with long, dark claws. His jeans had been torn, and he stood upon two legs curved in the fashion of a bipedal wolf. His jaw salivated as he stared back at me. We're going to read it! I shouted at him. I didn't know why I did, or if he could even understand me. All I knew was that he had given me that book for a reason, and whatever was happening was intrinsically tied to it. If there was an answer to this, it was in those pages. I felt myself dragged away by Eric. Holy fuck, Matt, let's go! The two of us fled into the tree line, our footsteps muffled by the sounds of the cabin being torn to pieces. Eric and I ran so hard that my lungs felt like they'd caught fire. Exhausted, I fell to the dirt with a groan. The pain of my smashed face, broken wrist, and a lifetime of poor decisions had finally caught up with me. I... I'm done, I breathed. Eric doubled back, crouching next to me. Take it easy, man. Look, he pointed ahead. We're nearly to the river. Let's get you some water. So we were. 
Now that I was catching my breath, the rest of my senses seemed to sharpen again. I could hear the rushing current just barely through the howling wind. I pushed myself to my feet and the two of us made our way to the bank, where I dropped to my knees and slurped as much water as my mouth could hold. Pass me the book, Eric said. I reached inside my jacket and handed it to him, its pages rolling in the storm. He held it closed, up to the light of the moon. The entire time you had this, he said, squinting at the cover. And you never noticed the author? I looked at him, wiping dribbles of water from my mouth. I mean, it's not like I've had it my whole life. I left it here when we went home. I really didn't need any mementos of that week. Who wrote it? Grandma, he said incredulously. He turned the book toward me and jabbed a finger at the bottom text. Gail G. Fastro. Well, I'll be damned. Don't sweat it, Eric said, shaking his head. I missed it on first glance, too. He glanced around, no doubt scouting for a place free from wind with enough moonlight to read by. Eventually, he settled on a large boulder near the water, shielded from the storm by a gnarled fir tree. He clambered it up with some effort. Did you know she was a writer? He called down to me. Not at all, I said. Come to think of it, I had no idea about anything Grandma did besides come over every Christmas and bake apple tarts. Mom never talked about it. Eric flipped through the book, open to the first page, and adjusted his glasses. Mind keeping a lookout while I peruse this thing? I nodded, rising from the riverbed and looking up and down the shore. No sign of the man, and no sign of the beast that destroyed the cabin either. So far, so good. I cradled my broken wrist and breathed a sigh of relief, pushing it out of my blood-caked nostrils in a painful snort. I hiked up the side of the bank, getting to higher ground so I could keep better watch over the area. As I did, the book played in my mind, the mysteries of the cryptids. Why would Grandma write something like that anyway? For kicks? She'd never so much as mentioned the Loch Ness Monster or Abominable Snowman growing up, and here she was a supposed authority on them. It seemed bizarre to me, but then, all of this did. Had she known about the man too? What about the beast? She must have. Something splashed in the river, and the hairs on my neck stood on end. I swallowed, my eyes searching up and down the running current, scanning every outcropped rock and wayward branch. Just a fish, hopefully. Seconds turned to minutes, the only sound coming from the croak of river toads and Eric flipping through the pages of mysteries. Maybe I was making a bigger deal about things than I needed to. I closed my eyes and tried the breathing exercises my therapist recommended. Then another splash, this one closer, louder. I strained my vision. Even beneath the glow of the full moon, the river's dancing waves were difficult to keep track of. Light gleamed off of them one moment, then died the next. Small flickers caught my eye, but when I'd look, I'd see only dark water staring back at me. Was something swimming toward us? Eric flipped another page of the book nonchalantly, his expression thoughtful, eyebrows furrowed in focus. He hadn't noticed a thing. Something felt wrong, though. It was the same feeling I'd had when I first came upon the man by the river like my mind was picking up on things that I hadn't yet fully processed. Eric, I called, taking a couple steps on the stone shore. Come away from the water. He looked up, perplexed. Why? He adjusted his glasses and looked around, holding his hair against the wind. Is something here? I need the light of the clearing to read, Matt. Just get off the fucking rock, man. Come over to me. I glanced upward. The moon shone, pale and ominous through drifting clouds. There's plenty of light over here. I'm nearly finished, just relax. Now, man, groaning, he creased his page and closed the book, then slid down the big rock, carefully. He steadied himself on the wet, clacking stones as he walked towards me. Fuck's sakes, Matt. Another splash. The day we met the man by the river, I said, the pain in my wrist fading against the backdrop of my mounting fear. I came back down to the water. What? Eric said, bracing himself against the roaring wind. I forgot the book. Jake brought us down fishing rods, remember? I was so excited that I'd forgotten all about mysteries. I left it on the riverbed. I was transfixed by the river now. Something was in there, I knew it. When I came back down to get it, I saw something in the waves. Like a fish, Eric said, finally reaching me. He turned, following my gaze to the river, though he looked skeptical. I shook my head. Bigger, I think, I don't know. I just grabbed the book and ran. Another splash, this one near the shore. I backed up, nearly slipping on the stones. Behind us, the pitch black of the woods, and in front of us, whatever lurked in the water. You hear that? I said. Eric nodded, stashing the book in his pocket. After what happened earlier, I say we don't take any chances. Let's find somewhere safer to read. Where, though? The woods? We'd get lost. And there was no question of that. 
back to the cabin or whatever was left of it? No point. The car was totaled. And besides, whatever beast had come knocking didn't sound nearly as reasonable as the man. It was probably still around. No, we were resigned to the river. We just need to be careful and stay as far from the shore as we could. Good Lord, said a voice nearby. I jumped, my arm flying in front of Eric instinctively. You boys have really worked yourselves up, haven't you? I wheeled around to see a familiar face standing at the height of the riverbank, a stone in his hand. He hurled it, and it landed in the water with a heavy splash. Uncle Jake? I shouted. He began walking down the bank, slowly, with a sway in his step, like he'd been drinking. Good news, boys. He shot us a smile, but it felt wrong. Horrible. His eyes were unfocused, and his tongue lolled from his mouth. I just found Griff, and he can't wait to see you. Uncle Jake ambled toward us, his pace irregular. One moment he moved slowly, the next frantically. His head seemed loose on his neck, rolling about with his momentum. I was so worried about you two, he said. Matt, Eric muttered. I held up my hand, indicating for him to be quiet. I was uncomfortable about all of this too, and Jake didn't seem like himself. After everything else that had happened tonight, I wasn't taking chances with anybody, family or otherwise. But still, I needed to know what the situation was. I needed to hear him speak. My eyes darted around, taking stock of our surroundings. If it came to a fight, I wanted to be ready. I cursed myself for letting the man take the fire iron. Still, there was always the river, and in a two against one, Eric and I had a chance against our uncle, even with my busted wrist. I swiveled my gaze back to Jake. He was only a couple car lengths away from us now, and I could see him more clearly. His eyes were pale, milky, and faded, like he was drugged. His mess of dark hair shot out from all angles beneath his trucker hat. I'd never seen him in such a sorry state. Boys, he said, burping. I just need to talk to you for a second, about Griff. He's just up ahead, but he's scared of the water. He gestured toward the wood, swaying on the spot. Come see him? I didn't say anything. I knew Griff was dead. I pulled his scorched skull out of the fireplace myself, and Eric had been there with me. Jake took a couple frantic steps forward. I recoiled, putting myself in front of Eric. Call it older brother instincts, call it stupidity. All I knew was this cabin wasn't going to claim any more of my family. Ah, Jake said, stopping and tilting his head. Are you afraid? Another burp. Of me? What's going on here? I said quietly. I'm talking to my nephews, he chuckled, (laughs) feet dancing to keep his balance. Come on, Matthew, Eric, let's go. Another step forward. Don't take another fucking step, I shouted. Stay the hell back. He paused, his demeanor changing. His face dropped, his sing-song smile replaced by a snarl, showing a row of yellow teeth. You boys were supposed to join us a long time ago, you know, but she got soft. What? No, she didn't, Eric said, stepping out from behind me. He held the book in his hands, holding it up to Jake. She realized how sick this whole thing was. She spared us. I had no idea what either of them were talking about, but Eric had clearly read something in mysteries while up on that rock, and whatever he'd read, Jake knew about it too. Spared you? Jake spat. He took off his cap and chucked it to the side, the corner of his mouth twitching. At the cost of the rest of us? Maybe. He took a shambling step forward, his eyes cold with menace. What makes you better than me? I knelt down, using Eric's tall frame as cover from Jake's vision. My good hand found a decent-sized rock, and I clutched it, rising back to my feet and placing it in my jacket pocket discreetly. We're not better than you, Eric said. That doesn't mean we deserve to become monsters either. Deserve to become monsters? What the hell had Eric read? You think I'm a fucking monster? Jake bellowed, eyes bulging. He slammed his finger to his chest. I'm a product of progress, just like you should have been. My heart thundered. I didn't know this man anymore. Have you been drinking, Jake? I hoped the answer was yes. I needed something to make sense tonight. Drinking? Jake said, his wild, cataract eyes looking from me to my brother. You ain't told him yet, have you, Eric? Didn't invite him to your book club? What's he talking about? Eric swallowed. He's talking about mysteries. No shit, I said, getting impatient. What about it? Help me the fuck out here, man. I, I'm sorry, he said, shaking his head. More anxiety. When it came down on Eric, it came down thick. The book's written like an autobiography, Matt. I thought it was a stupid pulp novel Grandma wrote, but it's like research notes, man. Research notes? Jake took another half-step forward, 
and my hand tightened around the stone. Stay back, I'm not kidding. He smiled. Come on, Matt. I've never hurt you before, have I? Yeah, research notes, Eric stuttered. I didn't think much of it, honestly. Thought it was part of the book's gimmick, but seeing Jake like this... Jake hunched his back, hands pumping in and out of fists. Like what, Eric? He growled. Don't talk to him, asshole, I said. Jake was bigger than me by about half, and in his current state, more unpredictable by a mile. If he came at me, I'd have one shot to clock him with the stone. Talk to me. Talk to you? He said, cocking his head. But you're so boring, Matt. All you've ever done is bitch, complain, and mope. His eyes drifted behind me to Eric. Your brother's always been the interesting one. And now he's even gone and figured out my mother's secret. Eric, I said, I really need you to get me up to speed. The the book, man, it's... English, man, what about the book? I kept one eye on Jake, my hands gripping the stone so hard that I could feel my palm cramping. Grandma wasn't some writer documenting cryptids, Matt. He brandished the paperback, then snapped it open, flipping through it aggressively until he hard stopped on a page. He thrust it in my face. I pulled my head back and squinted. The ink had faded from years of aging, not to mention the water damage from the river crossing. The left page looked like a list of ingredients, with pencil markings over the print, and beside them a set of tiny, bulleted instructions. On the right was a diagram, too complex for me to properly make out given the condition of the book. Wait, what? Some of the markings looked to be runes. No, they were definitely runes. She wasn't looking for cryptids, Matt, Eric said breathlessly. She was making them. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy these stories, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and check out some more of my episodes here.